So this open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the COVID pandemic. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order we find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to T. Bradley at town.arlington.ma.us.com. For this meeting, um, we are convening by video conference via the Zoom app that's posted on the town's website, which also identifies how the public may join. Please notice the meeting is being recorded and that some uh, attendees are participating by video conference. Therefore, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All the meeting materials have been provided members of this body and are available on the town website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda and after they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite members to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until you're recognized and your name is called. Remember to mute your phone, please, when um, you're not speaking. And also please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If you wish to engage in quality with other members, please do so through the chair. Uh, due to the size of my laptop screen, I may not be able to see all the members at once. If someone has raised their hand and I have not noticed, I hereby request that Tara Bradley or Annie LaCourt please bring this to my attention. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be taken by roll call. And we will, we will sort, shortly take that uh, roll call. Um, <clears throat> we also expect um, some um, guests tonight, uh, Dr. Boquillen, and also um, the chief financial officer at uh, Minuteman, whose name I don't have handy, but uh, we will look forward to hearing from them both. So now um, I'd like to ask the members of the committee to identify themselves as present when I call their name. Grant Gibbon. I didn't hear Grant. Shane Blundell? Here. John Ellis? Here. Micaiah Healy? Here. Brian Beck? Here. Arif Padaria? Here. Good morning or night, Arif? Good morning at 6 a.m. Uh, Sophie Magliazzo? Here. Jonathan Wallach? Shailene Pokris. Daryl Harmer. Here. Annie LaCourt. Here. Alan Jones. Here. George Koser. Here. Bill Keller. Al Tassi. Here. Wanda Nascimento. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. Here. And David McKinnon. Here. Thank you. Tara Bradley. Here. So, so we have a quorum and we'll proceed with the meeting as described in the agenda. Um, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make. Um, I know you're all waiting with bated breath. Um, so first of all, uh, no doubt you've seen the, the, um, the email from um, town manager Chaplain this morning indicated indicating that he's resigning from his position as of the middle of June. Uh, from uh, my perspective, I think this is uh, sad news for the town, as I think that uh, he has been a, a strong and innovative manager for Arlington, and we've done well under his stewardship. 
Uh, it's clear that he's not leaving to take another position with another city or town, but rather to assess the uh, direction of his life, his family, and his goals. I'm sure you all join me in wishing him well, and I'm hoping that we'll see him uh, before the committee before we uh, adjourn for town meeting. It's unlikely that Arlington will be able to recruit a new town manager by that time, but the town uh, has a strong department manager cohort and a good deputy town management uh, personnel, and we'll get good support from the select board. Uh, Arlington is a well-run community and uh, will manage the transition successfully as it has done in the past. This change does raise the importance of the Finance Committee scrutiny of budgets and warrant articles as we approach uh, town meeting. Um, we also re uh, had distributed by Tara a letter from Dr. Holman on the high school status, uh, which, is, which is good news. Dean uh, Carmen, do, do you have any comments you'd like to make about that, where we are in the, I believe we're on schedule and, and um, probably under budget, is that true? So that that is true. I mean, the only caveat to under budget is we're under budget because our actual interest rate on the bond offering is lower than the budgeted interest rate. So we're spending the, about the same amount that we thought we would on the project. As you know, with these projects, when they when you save they when they when they save money and when they when they go over budget on one area, they cut from another, and then the reverse occurs when they are under budget on area, they add back. So the total dollars usually stay the same, but the interest rate is lower. So yeah, I mean, the first phase is in, and now we go to phase two, which is like ripping that section down behind the new building, and then they'll build another section and we'll, we'll repeat. But, you know, as I, as I highlighted quickly in the email I sent out, it is, it's an exciting day for a, you know, a, a project that this committee has championed for the better part of like six, seven years now. You know, I, I would say, I remember when two former members, one, Steve DeCourcy, who's um, now on the select board and Carolyn White would talk about when they were um, students at Arlington High in the eighties. And we had, you know, sort of not gotten the building done at that point, And it resulted in like weird columns in the classroom and in hallways that went to nowhere and things like that. So, you know, it's a it's a good day for Arlington. Hey, thanks, Dean. Is there going to be a time when the public can go view that building? I haven't heard yet. I've been waiting to see that. I think they were just just the timing didn't allow for it, trying to get the kids in right now. OK, thank you. Um, another comment is that uh, we'll find out later, but the, um, Christine did uh, tell us last uh, meeting that the uh, DPW budget might be postponed tonight. If, if it is, we'll just take it up another night. Uh, there's also, uh, and, and Tara might have something to say about this later, there is now a number draft warrant uh, on the website. I haven't caught up on all my emails, but I don't know if it's been uh, distributed or not. But if you go to the town website, you can get that numbered warrant um, downloaded and you've got it. Um, it's still a draft and um, we, um, we will be correlating our um, T numbering system of the last meeting with the number system on the warrant and, and have another reading. We'll probably wind up doing that at the end of the meeting tonight as opposed to earlier. Uh, finally, I, <clears throat> it's not indicated on the website and it hasn't come up in discussion yet, but I, I want to give you a heads up that there likely will be a special town meeting within the town meeting. We, we've, I'm sure uh, town meeting members and finance committee members that have been around for a while have seen this in the past. Um, there may be in this special town meeting two uh, financial matters which we will need to address. First, um, there's a, a plan for an article uh, regarding private way betterment revolving funds. <clears throat> and to put it simply, the, uh, the article um, on, that, on the private way betterment system, which allows the town to uh, do repairs on private ways, uh, was created, I don't know, probably decades ago. And uh, the revolving fund is, is just probably too small for current efforts. Um, so we, we need to look at um, expanding the size of the revolving fund and expand, expanding the amount of capital in it. Um, the, way, the way the system works is that uh, the town does the repairs and then 
the the uh, butters uh, pay for it, and they either pay for it in a lump sum or over time or or through their taxes. So that spread out uh, payment system puts a demand on working capital cash in order to pay um, vendors, and and that's what needs to be addressed. And secondly, um, probably uh, Sophie and uh, Dave McKenna will uh, discuss this later tonight on one of the um, questions that they've been pursuing, but we may wind up having to um, uh, have an article about transferring the, the $1 million in the reserve fund that was um, in last year's or in this current year's budget and not used uh, back into the override stabilization fund or someplace else. In any event, uh, we, we'll discuss that a little bit later later tonight when we get to it. So those are basic, basically the uh, comments that I wanted to make. Does anyone have any questions about these things? Very quiet tonight, okay. Um, minutes. Uh, we have the minutes of uh, February 16th, is it, Tara? Yes, I've, I've, uh, I just sent that out last night, so my apologies to everyone for that. I've heard back from um, a few folks, um, and I have those. I have not heard back from Eagle Eyes Al Toasty, so um, I didn't know if he had any for me, but um, those are the usual folks who have comments. Um, so uh, I can show them now the comments. What? Yes, uh, please, can you put them up on the screen? Thank yes. you. So um, starting from the top, we had updates to the police uh, budget review area that came in from Daryl. Okay, well, if you can you uh, go to a screen with on that? Yep. That better? No, it didn't change the uh, didn't change the document. Doesn't matter. That's okay. Um, any any questions on any of these? These were all Daryl's corrections, which we since he gave the presentation, we know that they're correct. Okay, want to move on? And then the next section is planning and community development. I received these from Sophie. Okay. And moving on. Um, and then the next, the last update is um, just the addition of the presentation that Daryl gave as a reference document. Okay, great. So I think we're uh, prepared to have a motion. Well, first of all, any questions or discussions on the minutes of uh, February 16th? So um, I have a motion to accept the minutes as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. So moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, we're going to a vote. Grant Gibbion? Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Micaiah Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Arif Badaria? Yes. Sophie Magliazzo? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Um, Shailene. She's not here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Bill Keller. Oh, he's not here. Okay. He's not here. Yeah. yeah. Altasi. Yes. Juan de Nascimento. Yes. And Christine Deschler. Yeah. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Okay. The minutes are passing unanimously. So um, the next, I, I think we should um, postpone uh, as second reading of the. Um, Warren article to later in the meeting because we now have uh, several different documents to, to deal with. 
So um, is, is Dr. Boquillen here? Yes, he is. Dr. Yes, and team. And team, okay. So We're here, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Boquillen, I'd like, like to uh, ask if you would wanna make some introductions of your team and sure. then with your presentation. Um, but I would like to make a couple of comments um, first. And that is, um, I understand that you are retiring this year. I think the uh, school committee have selected a, the incoming superintendent. And um, I just wanted to say that um, um, I have personally, and I'm pretty sure the finance committee and the Arlington Town meeting has appreciated um, what you've done for the Minuteman High School system over the past 10 years, 12 years? I don't really- 15, Charlie. 15 years, okay, That's 15 <laughs> years. Um, I, I mean, it, it's it's been like a, I know this is an overused expression, but it was a breath of fresh air when you joined the, the school. I know you've done, uh, you know, great, great, taking great strides to improve the curriculum and the academic performance. And then to sort of cap off your uh, career there, you have uh, managed to, uh, totally rebuild the, the, the facilities into a modern, um, complete, and uh, exciting environment. So um, I would just like to congratulate you on all the accomplishments you made. And I want to do this before we start attacking you on the budget. <laughs> there yet, you know. Um, and, and these comments don't mean that we're not going to be critical of uh, the huge increases that I saw when I was looking at the budget. But in, in all seriousness, uh, you have done a, a wonderful job and I personally want to extend my thanks and I'm sure there may be other people on the committee that want to say something as well. I don't know. No, thank you. I Very kind words. I appreciate it. So um, why don't you proceed and um, in, in yes. your team and then go on with the presentation. So I have uh, with me the Assistant Superintendent of Facilities and operations, uh, Rich Eikonen, our business manager, uh, Nikki Andre, and of course, you know, Michael Ruderman is your uh, representative on the school committee from our- oh, Michael, I didn't, I didn't see you on the screen here. This is, <clears throat> let me, uh, for those, excuse me for interrupting. Dr. Go ahead. But um, I still don't see Michael, is he on? Look, My, look I, at the bottom of your screen. I believe I'm here. He's there. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. So um, for those um, new members of the committee, Michael Ruderman is the um, school, uh, Minuteman School Committee board member, uh, representative from Arlington, and uh, is, a, and is a dedicated, energetic uh, citizen in a lot of other areas as well. Glad to have Thank you, you here, Michael. I'm sorry. Dr. Thank you, Charlie. I was just dealing with a small screen here, and I missed that. That's all right. Maybe you should get a bigger computer. I, I should. <laughs> <laughs> or, or better glasses. I don't know which. Yeah, I'm hoping. Oops, let me go to the slideshow part. There we go. Does that look all right? Can you see that, Charlie? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Okay. So, it, you know, <clears throat> I appreciate your kind words, and it's been a uh, it's been an interesting 15 years. I, I really appreciate all the support, and I appreciate the 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 tough questions too. After I go through the Arlington FinCom, I'm ready for anybody. So <clears throat> I appreciate it. Overall, our operating and capital budget is up a little less than five percent. <clears throat> But our assessments to our member towns are up about 15% on average, and I'll uh, explain why that is. So our objectives for the budget this year were really, as every budget is, to protect the safety and health of our staff, <clears throat> continue to deliver high quality career and technical education, advance the Minuteman Academy model. Also, we're looking at how to increase enrollment or the capacity to have more enrollment because we've already exceeded the design enrollment of the school. Our athletic fields will be fully online in April. So we're preparing for um, the, the management of those fields as well as facility rentals. And we should be closing out the MSBA project in FY23. 
some of the larger budget drivers in the budget itself. Uh, we're in year three of a three-year contract with our staff. Health insurance, you may recall Minuteman is part of a, a health trust with four other uh, vocational schools. They haven't set their rates, um, the final rates yet, but we're planning on a 10% increase. And then as you would expect, increases in supplies and materials, utilities. Um, we have some more information on trying to get more aggressive with funding our OPED liability. Uh, leasing a couple of worksite travel buses for the vocational programs and continuing to fund our capital stabilization account. So if you break it out a little bit more, the uh, operating request is up about six and a half percent. What I call the operating capital, um, that's mainly for the ESCO lease as well as the uh, lighting on the new synthetic fields. And the MSBA project debt because of the way that we've borrowed and the rates that Dean was referring to earlier is down for next year. When you look at the Arlington assessment, the total assessment, including the debt is almost $8 million. Um, the debt service is 1.7 that's been excluded uh, by town meeting. And really the story of Minuteman currently <laughs> is enrollment. Uh, you can see a, a steady increase in member district enrollment from just the nine member towns and a corresponding decrease in non-member enrollment. We're projecting a little over 700 students for next fall. And I'll remind uh, folks that the design enrollment of the school was 628. So enrollment has shifted fundamentally and for the foreseeable future where we're gonna be having a school district that's funded entirely from member district or enrolled by member district students and funded by the nine member towns. That's a big change from the last 35 to 40 years of Minuteman where a lot of revenue was realized um, from out of district tuition and beginning a few years ago from an out of district capital fee that we were successful with your help in getting uh, approved through the Department of Ed. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but I'm trying to tell a little bit of a story here. <clears throat> you can see this blue line across the top. That's the millions of dollars we've had every year to offset member town assessments. And you can see at the bottom here, it goes to 880 to 1.2. That's the money that we received from our capital fee. And you can see that is trending down as well. We're projecting by FY25, there will be no out of district tuition of any substance. Um, sometimes we get transfer students in and that's how an out of district student might be in for a year or two. <clears throat> and you can see in sort of the orange bars, the corresponding increase in member town enro total enrollment. Uh, this aqua bar is the member town enrollment and then non-member town enrollment is down significantly. And that's continuing. And I'll show you a slide about the trends for next fall. <clears throat> so what I tried to do in this slide was to track the enrollment and the assessment increase. You may recall, I'm sure you do recall, uh, we have a new regional agreement and that regional agreement calls for a four year rolling average. And um, some communities that have had big spikes in enrollment this year, not in terms of numbers, but in percentages, um, it, that spike didn't transfer a line one-to-one -one with their increase in assessment because they're using that four-year rolling average. You can see Arlington had um, a 15% increase in enrollment and a little bit bigger increase in the total assessments. And that of course is due to the nuances in the funding, uh, cap in the funding formula for our assessments, which has a number of components, including uh, factors set by uh, by the state. Uh, this is just a per pupil assessment projected for next year, um, obviously with more students and pretty modest budget increases over the last 15 years. Uh, it's coming more in line and actually less than some vocational schools that we're traditionally compared to. Arlington enrollment has nearly doubled in six years. 
from 111 students or 115 students back in 2017-18 uh, school year. We're projecting uh, 222 uh, for the fall. And if we look at these trends um, and look at our application process and admissions process for the coming school year, which all applications, um, the deadline was last week, we had a total of 402 applicants, 303 of them from just our nine member towns. And we still take out of district applications because we're required to, and we go through the process with them, uh, but it's unlikely any will get in. So applications are up 24% just over last year. They're up over 100% uh, since FY19. And the class that we currently have as freshmen, 95% of these students are from our nine member towns. This just shows the, uh, the downward trend in out of district uh, tuition and capital fee revenue. That's part of our revenue plan, which is uh, in the budget book. Um, so you can see our non-assessment revenue is down almost, well, it's down 19%. For FY23. Again, that's just a review of our budget and the increases for requested. To get a little deeper into the budget, we are adding some new staff, a couple of professional support uh, folks. These are folks who may be school psychologists, school adjustment counselor, um, to provide for the social and emotional well being of our students. Um, we're adding a programming and web teacher. That was a single teacher department. Uh, we're adding a robotics and automation aid, uh, an HR clerical support specialist and a reading aid. We are not refilling some positions. So the net increase in FTE next year is only 1.5. We didn't have any active layoffs obviously, but we didn't refill some positions. And we've had real trouble finding a logistics engineering instructor. Um, I don't know, Arif, if you can help me with that. <laughs> Some of our priorities in career and tech ed, uh, the animal science program started this year, very popular. Our logistics engineering program, we just received another uh, grant through the capital skills grant to continue to develop that program, adding equipment, um, shop and material equipment increases across the board, uh, workplace safety gear and clothing for all students. And our student credentialing costs, I mentioned this and highlighted because that's uh, an important part of Minuteman where students receive industry recognized credentials and the costs of those credentials, we don't wanna forward on to the students. We traditionally took them out of grants. Those grants have shifted. So we're moving those costs. They're not significant, but uh, they're important into the district budget. So how do we accommodate more students without borrowing more money? Uh, we have two projects in line right now, two strategies. Uh, you may recall that we had a couple of foundations built on the building on the site that we were going to use to build storage sheds that the students would build as part of their program projects. Well, the North Foundation, um, we're going to expand that into a metal fabrication shop. It's right next to the welding shop. Um, and we're using our capital stabilization account to fund that. Um, it's projected around $735,000. Uh, we've gone to bid on the building. It should be erected sometime in May. And then the students will finish it off over the summer. We'll hire some students to work with their teachers and that will add about 32 students over four years. The second strategy that we're utilizing is to leverage our strategic partnerships with different businesses that we work with. Um, several years ago, in 2018, Governor Baker signed special legislation that allows Minuteman to enter into long-term leases with mission compatible partners. And on the East campus, we had a MIT Lincoln Lab daycare center, which was then occupied by an independent day school. It's about a 16,000 square foot building. And we're 
um, talking with some potential partners to transition that and renovate that building into academic classes and a veterinary clinic for our animal science center. I'll mention, you know, the, the space constraints in the new building are not in the vocational technical areas. We have enough square footage for 800 students. We do not have enough <laughs> academic space. And that's the result of the MSBA formulas, which I'm sure you're familiar with as you've gone through this process with the MSBA yourselves, but it limits the academic space um, with certain formulas. So that's the real critical component. Um, our OPEB liability projected as of this June is about 26 million. A year, two years ago, it was 32 million. Uh, we only have about a half a million dollars in our OPEB trust fund. So the school committee formed a, a, a study group and the study group gave some recommendations to the, to the school committee. This was one of the recommendations was how to fund the contributions over the next six years and you'll see in FY25, those contributions take another good bump. And that's because we're retiring the ESCO lease, which was a 15 year tax exempt municipal lease. <clears throat> and we did have some stranded assets in there. Another Foskett ism that I like to use. Um, so, and we're also going to be for every new hire, uh, we're gonna be setting aside and budgeting $10,000 for each new hire to go into the OPEB trust fund. Uh, so this is, I'm coming to the end of the, of the uh, budget presentation to the FinCom. Uh, this is where we're at. And I'm happy to answer any questions or review any slides. I'm trying to get. Al Tassi. Yes, hi, Ed. Hi, Al. Uh, two questions. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, but two of the uh, big senders of uh, students to Minuteman over the years was, of course, Belmont, that was a member, and Watertown, uh, which was not, but, but mm -hmm. sent all the students. This is just curiosity. Do you know what they're doing with their students now? Um. I don't know specifically, but I know generally that Belmont really has no options other than Minuteman. Um, Watertown, we've had over 20 applicants in the, for the freshman class and none of them are gonna get in. We reached out to Watertown over the years, as you know, and uh, without much response. Yeah. You know, they're in the process of building a new school and I think they're gonna try to add some vocational programs uh, into the new Watertown High School, but it's really, um, it's, a, it's, it's more than a shame. It's tragic that these kids from all of the towns that left have no place to go. And you said it would happen. I said it would happen. And now it's happened. Yeah. Okay. And just a second question, actually a concern. And I hardly ever have a concern when positions are eliminated, mm. but you have a position of HR director, which is being eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 2000s, Arlington uh, school system in a uh, budget crunch eliminated its HR director. And within two years, if I could use the expression, stepped in it uh, and it, it had cost a lot of money. Mm. Uh, is, is that a dangerous thing to do to eliminate the professional HR position? In this case, it was more of a reorganization, Al, than a elimination of the duties or the requirements that we have in terms of our collective bargaining agreement and, you know, just managing our workforce. So the assistant superintendent, uh, Amy Peralt, has taken over the HR functionality, and we've reorganized different um, people's responsibilities within the district office. Um, when we, when we added Nikki, we've added an assistant business manager, we've added a accounts payable clerk, and next year we're gonna add another HR support specialist. So I, we've got all of our bases covered and people are very well uh, trained. Uh, we actually, I think, have improved our HR functionality and service um, 
approach to our staff. And it's been so far working very well. We've been through the whole year with this reorganization. Because the HR director position was eliminated back in uh, April of last year. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Dr. Bookwillen? I have one, Charlie. Oh, go right ahead, Sean. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Um, and thanks for the presentation. I guess uh, my question is sort of how do we measure success? Um, just interested in like how many, you know, graduation rates for, for four years, sort of, you know, we're a vocational school. So we're sending people to college, to apprenticeships, and sort of how much success do we have in placing graduates in, again, like academic or sort of, uh, sort of workforce sort of, uh, places? Yeah, so thanks. thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Um, some of that information is in uh, the budget book. Some will be in the town report. But generally speaking, over the last 10 years or so, we've had about a 97 to 99% placement rate of our graduates. Between 60 and 65% are going on to post-secondary education. And another 30 to 35% go directly into the workforce. Um, and I think the other way we measure success, I love the question, um, is in terms of the number and quality of industry recognized credentials that students who are leaving here uh, get. For instance, in environmental technology, the students get their wastewater treatment operator's license. They get their freshwater operator's license. And you know, if you're dealing with a municipal water system that those jobs are in high demand right now and they pay very, very well. Um, you know, the uh, students out of Allied Health, they don't get all their traditional, you know, CPR, first aid, EKG technician, and as well as their EMT. Uh, they're able to sit for the EMT licensure when they're 18 and most of them turn 18 as they're leaving. But uh, so that's some of the stuff that comes to mind. Any more questions, Sean? Uh, Shane? Nope, that's it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sophie, you have your hand up. I do. Um, I'm, this is sort of a follow up question that I understood at a previous meeting from someone else. What um, does Minuteman take or spend money on students with special needs or IEPs? <laughs> yeah, um, Minuteman, about 47% of our students are on an IEP. Another eight to 12%, depending on the year, are on a 504. Minuteman has the highest percentage of students on IEPs than any other high school in the state. Um, our students do very well. Uh, we have an integrated uh, model. Um, our MCAS scores and test results uh, last year, or the last year we had MCAS, 100% of our students passed MCAS English Language Arts on the first try. And when you consider close to half of them were on an IP, um, it says something about the staff and the quality of, of what we're doing with students and who um, need supports. I will mention though, that in the application process, we're blind to their special ed status. We don't, people don't, um, we don't ask about their IEP status until they've been offered admission. Thank you. Question, Sophie? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Boquillen? Okay, thanks. Well, wait, wait, wait. I wait. Have... <laughs> Dean, you have a question? <laughs> well, I, I have a comment, so I didn't want to make my comment um, until the questions were over. Oh, I think Charlie's got a few for me. So, Charlie, um, you can ask your question first. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and Makaya so, has a question, too. Who has a question? Makaya. Oh, Makaya. Uh, sorry, well, thank you. Go first. Oh, mine was related to Shane's. Um, it's a question uh, I usually ask um, the HR director um, and the, um, the finance committee the finance director here, but like what relationship do we have um, with graduates and municipal jobs, especially from the nine district? 
um, member um, schools, uh, especially since there's such a shortage of, of tech, um, tech jobs. Is there a relationship there? Well, we get frequently get calls for students. We have a work co-op program so that students in their senior year, instead of coming to their vocational technical program, they would go to work. And uh, many of them over the last, many of them of my, that I'm aware of have gone and worked for municipalities. Uh, we had one student in environmental tech who went, um, I guess there's a wastewater treatment plant in Bill Ricca. Um, she went and worked there for her co-op job making $27 an hour. Um, when she graduated, she ended up working full time for them and worked her way through, uh, I think it was UMass Lowell and got a degree in environmental science, uh, ended up coming back here and working as a, a technical assistant as well. So we get calls frequently from our communities um, and from community-based organizations within our communities uh, that work with our students in a number of different ways work with our programs in a number of different ways. One of the great examples with Arlington is Arlington Eats and the program we've been running for two years where um, uh, the food rescue program brings raw food products to our culinary arts program. They prepare it and, and, they, and then it gets picked up again and distributed over 400 meals a week that we're still doing uh, to food insecure families in, in our area. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, that helps. Um, so is it usually on individuals to make that connection or is there a staff member to, um, to coach um, well, that have, to be a liaison? We have a, a co-op director, a work co-op director, and then our, our CTE director. We also have some staff that are uh, paid to um, coordinate outside projects. Um, where our students go offsite. Right now we have two projects with Habitat, one with a historical society. Um, so yes, we're, we're very active in terms of reaching out. Community service is sort of a core value of ours. John Ellis, you have your hand. I'm sorry, uh, are you, does that answer your question, Makaya? Um, yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, I was asking mostly about jobs after after college um, versus um, community service based projects, but that, that answers my question. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, John Ellis. Do you still have a forestry program? Uh, we never really had a forestry program. We had a construction, a uh, landscape construction program. We I have Arlington's, a uh, uh, the question from Makaya raised my interest because. This is this is older, but uh, I mean, our tree warden went to Minuteman and did some sort of forestry program there, probably about twenty-five years ago. And uh, there's a, yeah. definitely a shortage of tree wardens and or, and, uh, and certified arborists in the in the state. Absolutely. So there's no, but there's no forestry program or horticulture program. A, yes, there's oh. a horticulture and landscaping program. Okay. Yep. Grief. Yeah, hi, Ed. Um, hi, Arif. <laughs> good to see you. Greetings from India. Um, so, I, so thanks again for all the 15 years of service, and I'm sure you've had many a sleepless night. My question here is a more generic one, but I wanted to approach it from away from the slides, I suppose. What keeps you up at night? I know there are only a few nights left for you, uh, but <laughs> what is it that really bothers you? I mean, yes, there's an increase in budgets and all the rest, but uh, ultimately, what would you like to bring out that hasn't been brought out from those slides? Yeah. Well, besides Charlie's questions, uh, I would say, you know, re really right now, and I think a lot of folks in education feel this way, I hope they do. I'm really concerned about the emotional well-being of our staff and our kids and what they've all been dealing with with two years. Uh, I, I, um, we talk about it a lot here and we have different programs, but I, I think it's so systemic, the, the pain and the tragedy and the, and the stress that people have been under. Um, I really think that's going to have an impact on learning. Um, it, we've seen it in a number of different ways in terms of students who require hospitalization 
that those numbers are up. Uh, so that really concerns me. Um, I, I think the other thing that concerns me is the kids in our own district that we don't have room for. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. Well, there is, and I'm doing all I can, but um, I try not to dwell on the past and what we could have done, should have done, all that kind of stuff. But um, kids not being served and kids being in stressful situations and having having to deal with it for years to come. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ed. Dean, you wanted to make a comment? I, I did, yeah. Um, so I wrote some notes. So I do want to echo um, Charlie's words of praise for Dr. McClellan. I might be a little more um, detailed. I, I have to be honest, Dr. McClellan, I was shocked like 15 years wow that's a mm. i don't know i like and i gotta be honest there are very few town officials i think i've ever worked with that i miss i'll miss when they leave but like the two i'm gonna miss the most have left in two years in a row um meaning dr Bodie last year and you this year um and i just like for for the larger membership i i think it's it's important to understand how consequential these last 15 years were right so like when Dr. B started, and I wrote it down, right? We, we had a dying and decaying building at Minuteman. We had outdated programs. We had a downright hostile management of the school who just didn't care about us. I mean, they showed up to town meeting and they were like, hey, we already have the vote. Or they showed up to the finance committee and started by saying, well, we have the vote. So whatever you tell us, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, you know, they had no budgetary controls. And I remember... Um, I remember at the time, Paul Olson was like, you know what, we're so fed up. Why don't we just withdraw and, and sue them and we'll figure it out from there, right? I mean, it was really ugly. Um, and, and, and it's, it's been, a pre, it has been a, like a very important 15 years, right? We went from thinking about winding the school down to you know, fighting these policy and political battles. You know, we, you know Dr. B deleted you know, poor program, programs that were outdated and should have gone away. He added new ones. He helped steer the political process for a new regional agreement. He, you know, helped work through the building committee vote. And then when Belmont decided to back out, we had to do the, the district referendum. And then we had to build the building. Um, it's, been a, it's been a big, big accomplishment. And, you know, the, the one thing I will always remember, Dr. B, I'll be my sort of lasting image. It's what I always tell people about. I feel like my relationship with you is... And I want to share with the committee is when we were, when Belmont had withdrawn and we had to go to the district vote, we were trying to rally people to our side and, um, or we were withdrawn from the agreement. Now we had to go to the district wide vote. We were, we were having a meeting in Belmont. And I remember saying to Dr. Uquellen, um, I said, you know, if Belmont withdraws, we're going to kick all their kids out of the school, right? And he said, Dean, my job is to provide high quality vocational education for every child that asks for it and that I can fit in the building. And I said, right. And then we're going to kick the kids from Belmont out. <laughs> and he said, and he said, no. And he repeated what he told me. And he said, your job on the political side is to say who can't come in. My job is always going to be to look out for the children who need and want this education. If you want to throw them out, Dean, that's up to you and the people in Arlington. And I always remember that it was just, it was your, your, your singular focus that these children who needed this school and this form of education mattered. And they mattered the day they show up, they matter the day they leave. And I, I will always, you know, I will always remember you as a, probably the greatest champion I've ever known for, you know, vocational education and children who deserved what, what they're getting at Minuteman today. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank I you. know if Dan Dunn was here, he would agree. Dan, he, he fought like hell. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it's, people owe you a debt of gratitude for this. It's, it's huge. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Dean. So <clears throat> I still have my questions, Dr. Bob. Okay. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I'd like to bring you back to your slide too. Sure. You've got uh, two um, two changes there that I, I'm hoping somebody can just dig down a little bit and, and explain them for us. One is the, um, 
the assessment to members has gone up by 15%. That comes out to about 3.4 million. Did that all come from the drop in non-member towns or is there? No. What's the other cause of that? Um, I can. The other cause of it is the formula set by the department in terms of your minimal, minimum local contribution. And also, let me just see where it is here. Well, I have I have Arlington's assessment components here. Um, but Nikki can help me if I get this wrong, but some most of it is from the drop in out of district revenue. The other is from a drop in or an increase in your required local minimum contribution. So in Arlington's case, the minimum required local contribution, which is set by the Department of Ed, went up 26% on its own. I can show you that slide right here. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? So these are yes, the components sir. of the assessment. So the state is requiring that you pay more anyway. And I think, I, I don't know, I can't see Nikki, but I don't know if any other town had that significant an increase in local required contribution. So you gotta remember those formulas are set by the state. There's no rolling average in there. Um, they're looking at the actual enrollment from a chapter 78 point of view from the previous October one. So these are included. You're, these you're saying that's a, that's a function of our increased enrollment. It's a function of your increased enrollment, your overall wealth factor and other factors that go into that chapter 78 calculation. Okay. So I think you had that, that would make uh, I think the um, you had about a one point one point seven or two million dollars drop in um, in in revenue the revenue from out of district. So that that would get us pretty close to the three point six million. I think. Yeah. Three million. And no, then on the top ahead. of that on the top of that slide, you, you have this four point nine six percent increase over fiscal twenty two. Um, Including uh, you had a, a over a million dollar drop in the um, in the in the interest right from from um, our bond yeah our bond uh, requirements service yeah so what are the components of that change of the I mean, MSBA project debt well, drop? what well let me rephrase it the, the increase in students was um, about twenty percent right from from uh, this year versus last year, for for Arlington. Well, no, for uh, for the whole for the whole district. A little less than that, I think. Yes, our applications were up twenty four percent, but enrollment, uh, I think, was up about eighteen. So, but your um, your cost went up five percent in the aggregate. Yes, and so that's. Um, that's the entire variable component. Is that, is that one way of looking at it? It's a, it's the a most significant variable component. This slide that I'm showing you now is, is a comparison of your assessment components from last year to this year. Let me just put this up again. <clears throat> so last year, well, you can see. Yeah. Enrollment okay, in so, Arlington. Yeah. Is that, is that helpful? Yes, very much. Okay, so um, so I guess I can conclude that we had um, an increase in in um, student population of something approaching twenty percent, but our total operating cost is only up five percent. Yes, and the change in assessment is principally due to drop in the in the um, tuition from out of district schools and a 30% increase in the, in the state mandated expenditure. Is that correct? Generally speaking, that's pretty accurate, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to understand.
Any any other questions for Dr. Boquillon? Al Tassi. <clears throat> One issue that uh, I was just curious about is uh, energy costs. Mm. Uh, you've been in your new building now for a couple of years, uh, and I remember you were expecting or hoping that moving from a building built for about 1,200 students uh, to a building built for about 628 students uh, that's, that's new with all the new technology, that you would have a significant savings in energy costs, heating, air conditioning, lighting, et cetera. Um, has that met your expectations? No, not at all. And we just had, so, um, I think it was in November, we had our 250 kilowatt photovoltaic system came online. So we're hoping, and I, I'll remind you, as you know, this is the first year, the 2021-22 school year is the first year we've been in the school fully populated um, because we had to leave in March because of COVID. We weren't here last year, full building. And, you know, we were following the uh, recommendations and running our HVAC system at a much higher exchange rate than uh, we would normally do. We didn't have the bodies creating BTUs in the building. So the design, the design, we never were really able to get into a design mode. So this is our first year. We're seeing uh, no dramatic increases from last year, but those reductions that I had hoped for and expected, I haven't seen. Um, and frankly, I don't think we'll understand the building uh, for another year to go through a full heating and cooling cycle with a normal population in the building. Um, but the photovoltaic system has been projected to save us between 30 and 40,000 a year on electricity costs. Plus it, it's solidified or guaranteed our $2 million reimbursement from the state, which we'd always planned on. It wasn't a new 2 million, but we'd planned on it. Thank you. Yep. Dr. Bocon, I have another uh, question. Last, I, I think it was last year, um, you invested some money in the uh, fields. I think it was the yep. first thing. And you were projecting that um, the, leasing the use of the field to outside parties was going to pay for those capital expenses. Has that happened? Well, because of COVID, it hasn't, but we're definitely on track to meet those objectives. We um, are now starting to rent um, the outside facilities, three lighted synthetic fields. Uh, we're getting calls every day. We increased our rates significantly. Um, <laughs> and it hasn't stopped the flow of interest at all. Um, Rich Eikonen has got a closer uh, finger on the pulse of that than I do, but we're very pleased with the amount of interest in the fields. Um, we haven't rented the interior spaces out yet just because of COVID and masks. And we've got a lot of kids in the building on a lot of activities at night. Our Minuteman Technical Institute is doing very well. Um, we're going to have summer school again for the first time in a couple of years, sort of a normal summer school in camps. So, um, you know, I stayed, I stayed an extra year to be in the new building for a year and then COVID hit and I couldn't leave. So um, I don't know. I'll call you in a year, Charlie, and I'll ask you how it's going. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? for Dr. Boquillon? Not a question, but I'd just like to echo Dean's sentiments that it's been um, a breath of fresh air to have you on board these last 15 years. It's made a huge difference to discussing the minimum budget at town meeting. And it was a great pleasure to be uh, working with you the first couple of years I was on the finance committee. Thanks, Annie. Welcome. No, I really appreciate it. I, I look forward to being at town meeting in person. Are you gonna have town meeting in person or don't you know yet? Don't I don't think so. No? Well, that's too bad. I could sit in the back with those guys who make noise and <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep we'll keep you up to date. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um 
So, um, Arif, do you want to make a motion? Uh, yes. So I would like, if you look on page uh, six of the presentation, there's the Arlington preliminary assessment. So I believe, Mr. Chairman, we're making a motion for the total assessment to Arlington, which would be 7,947,939. Is there a second? <clears throat> Altasi? Second. Annual court seconded. So any further discussion on the Minuteman preliminary budget? And, and let me just ask, um, ask you, uh, Dr. Boquillen, uh, the, the word preliminary there is because we don't have the final uh, numbers from the state? Correct. Yeah, okay. It cannot go up, it can only go down, that assessment that you vote. Okay. So um, any further discussion on um, the Minuteman budget? Uh, Michael Ruderman, did you wanna say anything? Uh, not not uh, beyond the fact that um, you know I too am very proud of the job that Dr. B has done. I've been connected with Minuteman first as a parent and then a volunteer for the last ten years, and um, it has been a pleasure to work with someone with his vision. And that vision now expands to trying to deal with um, the success of Minuteman. In, in the applications and providing more spaces for more kids who want to attend and increasing the um, you know, daily attendance figure from, from somewhere in the 600s up to 800, all within the budget that we've presented to you tonight. Um, it's a very gratifying experience and I wanna thank him for that. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, hearing, seeing no other uh, requests for comment, um, we'll move to a vote on the Minuteman budget as presented by uh, Arif and seconded by Al Tassi and Annie LaCourt. Uh, Grant Gibeon? Jane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Makaya Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Arif Padaria? Yes. Sophie Miglazzo. Yes. Jonathan Wallach. He's not here. Uh, Daryl Harmer. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Coaster. Yes. Bill Keller. He's not here. Uh, Al Tosti. Yes. Juan de Nascimento. Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. The uh, Minuteman uh, budget is uh, supported unanimously. Dr. McQuillan and team, thank you very much. Appreciate your time this evening. So the um, next question are, um, Christine, are any of the public works uh, or facilities budgets uh, available for tonight? We can do facilities tonight. Okay, take it away, please. Okay, if somebody could put up the facilities budget that is on page 80, that would be helpful. Perhaps. Um, Thank you. Um, for um, for people who don't who are new, um, the facilities department is a relatively new department. It was formed roughly about seven or so years ago, um, and its its role is is obviously to to uh, handle the maintenance requirements and take care of the uh, the town's buildings, um, most of which are the schools. Uh, it's it has um, so slowly acquired more portfolio, more properties in its portfolios over time. Um, and I think it continues to do so and will do so. Um, although it's been a new um, 
department, it has already gone through, I think, four different directors. Um, and um, Jim Feeney, who is temporary acting um, facilities director, uh, explained that uh, the, the, the market for um, person, a person with the skills and experience is pretty hot. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to get people to uh, join a municipality when there are universities and other businesses who are hungry for uh, people who could fill this position. Having said that, um, we are encouraged to hear that uh, the expectation is that they will be bringing on a new director perhaps as early as next month. Um, so hopefully we will have a new director very soon and hopefully that director will have a bit of a tenure with us uh, unlike prior directors. Um, looking at the um, salaries page, um, you can see that there is very little change um, in, in the budget. Uh, the um, salaries um, um, expense line has actually gone down a bit, and that's because we've lost a director of facilities and a long time administrative assistant. Um, so that explains why um, salaries have gone down very slightly, but gone down nonetheless this year. Um, I, I will also um, say that although we see that there are only what, four custodians, um, the facilities department is supported by uh, a good many other maintenance and trades people that are in the schools. Um, so it's not just the four custodians taking care of all of the, all of the town buildings. So I just want to let people know that. Um, looking at the uh, facility is expensive. I think we've heard already a couple of times that the reason that the 5202 professional maintenance and the um, 5269 repair maintenance lines have increased because um, the uh, facilities department is, is um, being tasked with taking on more of the uh, maintenance of the libraries, the police, and the fire stations. So money has been moved from those budgets into this budget to reflect that. Um, and that's, that is really the, the big uh, increase. Um, in the facilities department expense line item. Um, I don't think we really have anything more to add to what um, was presented in the budget. Um, I will say that um, Mount Gilboa, people who are interested, is no longer being rented out and the town is um, currently undergoing, conducting a study as to figure out what the best use of Mount Gilboa it will be. And until that's completed, it, there is no intention to uh, rent that space out. Um, just also informationally, um, the, uh, the line item 5810 green repairs, that um, is, there has been for several years now um, an um, amount budgeted $20,000. That money is, um, to be used when we can to um, as matching uh, uh, to acquire some grant money. So we the, the, that twenty thousand dollars, any portion of that is used to up leverage some grants. Um, and professional services, the five eight two seven line is there in case there are um, any. Um, that something breaks, something needs to be fixed, uh, and we need some money to pay for um, architectural or engineering um, uh, reports or, or studies or um, estimates. So that money is used as on, on an as needed basis. Um, and the offset you see is from the schools. And that represents the work uh, that the facilities department does on behalf of all the school buildings. Um, John, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to the to the budget. 
information? No, I, I mean, I thought it was interesting that the, the amount of, uh, you know, technology needs that a facilities department requires uh, and that they might need additional staffing in the future because the kinds of buildings that are being built um, are, you know, very sophisticated computers, um, you know, for everything from entry to intercoms to lighting systems. And um, they all have very complex systems and manuals. And somebody who was hired, uh, you know, traditionally in a facilities job to, to um, you know, do wiring or electrical repair um, is a different kind of skill set than somebody who needs to necessarily, you know, reprogram um, the card entry system when everybody in the school is locked out and, uh, you know, the school has to get open. So um, I think that this department, just like the DPW has recently picked up a position that's um, a technology-based person, this department, um, you know, may be looking at that kind of uh, staffing requirement too. Andy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether or not the responsibilities that John Ellis just mentioned would fall under facilities or would fall under the IT department. Do we know? In most organizations I've worked in, those would be IT issues once the systems were in place. You, you could be right, Annie. At this point, it's just um, it's just a dream to to get to get somebody whether in the facilities department itself for IT or a combination to be able to handle this. Um, I, I think the hope, I, I know I have the hope that when we finally get a permanent facilities director, uh, that there'll be some time and space for that person to give all of this some thought and, and try to figure out what, what the departments or what the town needs and where that person or people would be best situated. Thank you. You know, uh, it, it strikes me, Annie, uh, that maybe uh, it's a little bit like um, the, uh, you know, modern car repair. You know, yep. 15 years ago, it was all wrench, maybe 20 years ago, it was all wrench and hammer or whatever. And, and now it's, um, you know, electrical subsystems that have to be interpreted and maintained. So it's not necessarily the IT department, but more IT people who are specialists in um, highly uh, automated main, uh, you know, equipment, facilities equipment. Well, the good thing is they'll all be in the same building. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brian Beck. Yeah, uh, quick question. Um, on the energy usage, do you have electricity and natural gas? Um, have they rethought that at all? Um, as you look this year, the rates are up considerably to date, and I only assume they're going to get more expensive. Um, is, is that something that, since it's such a big number, that maybe it should be higher for, for all I know, but just it looks like they're just copying last year's numbers? Well, they seem to be in line with actuals and maybe a little bit more. If you look at the natural gas actuals, um, 41,000 for 20 and 21 being budgeted now for, at 50,000. Um, you may be right that that may prove not to be um, sufficient, but um, I, I think it's a reasonable estimate. That's fine. I just want, yeah, again, I'm trying to be um, reasonable too and make sure they have what they need. Shane. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks, Christine. Um, so we talked we talked at the outset about it. We have like the brand new wing of our high school and hopefully it lasts a very long time, but um, you know, obviously like lots of technology and maintenance that's required and like a, a facilities department seems really important to keep our brand new building sort of uh, well-maintained. So I know you said it's a hot market, so like, you know, is there a plan in place to hire? Are they posting? Are they thinking of like the job description, the pay? I mean, how do we, be, how does Arlington compete, I guess? Or how, what's, is there some sort of plan in place 
So I expect that Jim Feeney is, you know, I think this is a, what, the second, <laughs> at least second time he's the acting yeah. facilities director. So just well, curious if there's a vision. Well, as I said, that they're, they're, they, they have been intervie interviewing and they are, they think they can bring someone on board maybe as soon as next month. Um, but I think you uh, ask a good question. Are, are, is, is the, the job requirements, um, is given the job requirements, is the salary sufficient? Um, I, I don't know if the reason people left was salary, purely salary based, um, but that, that, that's, um, I, I would think that having, having had so many directors come through and in such a quick span of time that, they, that the, the town manager will be thinking about why and is there something that can be done to be able to keep people. But again, I don't know why people left. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. <clears throat> uh, Alan Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for a long time, there have been concerns that town buildings and school buildings uh, have suffered uh, from deferred or lack of proactive maintenance. And I know there, there was talk when the facilities department was created to have, uh, you know, use good automated tools to uh, project, you know, failures and things that could be done, uh, you know, based on statistics um, and experience. And I'm wondering, do you see that sort of effort uh, going on yet in the facilities department to really analyze and forecast, you know, when is this going to break and what can we do to give it a little more life and whatever? In other words, is it, do you think it's sufficiently proactive and not just reactive? I, I think it is clearly the desire is to be proactive. I know that when the facilities department began, there was a desire, and, and actually I think we did, um, use uh, a, 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 a school dude, which is a rather well-established program. Mm -hmm. And then we had a new director who didn't, I don't, uh, my understanding was that the, that another direct, the new director wasn't enamored with that and switched to something else. And then there was this, that person left and then there was this realization, no, we really should have stuck with that. Um, so there's, again, I think because of the, the turnover, it's been hard to find mm. something and stick with it. Um, but I do know from the creation of this department, which I was involved in and meeting with all of the subsequent directors and the act, temporary acting director, that, that this is why this department exists, is to be proactive, to, to not... Um, just respond to the, the loudest voice, the squeak wheel, um, but to be more thoughtful of what needs attention when, and if it doesn't, if that's if that can wait while we do something else more more important, more urgent, bigger, we'll do that. But we'll get you on, we'll get you on the list. Don't don't worry, we'll get you on the list. I know right. that, that was that's that's the point of having this department. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, I remember that from when the department was created, but it sounds like due to turnover or whatever that that's still yeah. in the future. I, and I was asking that because I don't, I didn't see anything in the budget and I don't think even in the capital budget for, you know, purchase of software programs or anything. So they got, they, they got a $10,000 grant from the insurance, some insurance agency that works mm -hmm. with a lot of municipalities. And that $10,000 is spent on a software program that does asset management. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest portion of that work is is a tagging and barcoding and then uh, labeling and so that they know what uh, pieces of machinery need to be, uh, you know, maintained when. And so that's mm -hmm. a new program. I forget what it's called. Um, and with that grant, they got uh, they had enough funding to, to do like a couple schools or something like that. And in future budgets, there'll be a five thousand dollar annual fee for this software that they're using. That um, that does that kind of uh, what they call asset, um, you know, asset management tool. So that tool does exist, and it's slowly being implemented. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Any other questions on facilities? So I, I had a couple of thoughts and I think they've been somewhat uh, addressed. One was the software that was just, just discussed. And also the, as Shane brought up earlier, the increased energy costs. Um, I'm sorry, that was Brian brought up this uh, change in energy costs. But <clears throat> my third question was um, somewhat subjective, but it seems to me that we have a new, very expensive and complex high school coming online. Have, do we have any idea of what the maintenance costs are going to be in that uh, building? Is, are they going to be greater than the old high school or less than the old high school? And, and how are we prepared for it? I, I don't know the answer to that. I can inquire. I, I, I mean, I, I suspect that um, that the Arlington uh, High School Building um, Committee has had a uh, subcommittee or a group working on on sort of the maintenance and operating costs of the building. And, and am I correct in assuming in, in saying that the the facilities budget includes the town buildings and the school buildings, right? Most of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I mean, I think that may not be a big issue in fiscal 23, but as the, as this building comes online, I, it's, I think it is going to be a big, big issue. Well, Jim Feeney did mention that, and, and John Ellis alluded to this just a few minutes ago, that the, the, the newer the building, the more complex the building, um, the, the greater the skill needed to take care of the building. Um, there's a new, new talent, different talents need to be utilized and things are more complex. So I wouldn't be surprised that um, even though it's a new building, it, it may be the day-to-day -day maintenance costs may actually be more expensive. You know, in another follow-on that if the building committee isn't thinking about this, they, they, they should be, and, and Jim is thinking about it, but doesn't have a solution to it. And that's, the issue of, of warranties. So the school will have, a, I think, a one-year warranty from the general contractor, but then there could be dozens or maybe hundreds of individual warranties for subsystems within the school from, you know, sinks to, to door panels to, you know, IV, AV tools, whatever. And when something breaks, digging down and figuring out whose warranty covers it and you know where is the manual that explains the warranty um he had he's ha it's something he's had to do and is is a lot of work and there are tools that do warranty management but the town isn't you know using that so you know when the when the when the school is done and delivered you know we we get a year warranty but then there's a lot of other things that could potentially break within the lifetime of warranties that those different subsystems provide that we, we may not have any way of figuring out what those are when those things and if those things break. So um, I, I, I think it, it would be a good idea if, um, if you touch base with the, uh, I mean, maybe Mike Mason could direct you in the right dir direction on the, on the, um, School, um, the Arlington High School Building Committee, uh, to for who's ever con concerned about operations and maintenance costs, and, um, and 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 follow up on you know the various ideas that have been discussed tonight on like the, so the software management system and then warranties and then scheduling asset whether if, even if they're out of out of uh, warranty scheduling. Uh, maintenance of the assets based on their their use and, and longevity, because I, I can tell you, having been on a on the capital planning committee for many many years, we were always uh, frustrated because we were faced with capital expenditures that had to be made because maintenance wasn't 
appropriately addressed along the way. So I, I'm not going to I'm not going to suggest that we postpone the budget over that because I don't think it's going to impact this year's budget. But it would be a good idea to um, bring some focus on that. Somebody I get I don't know if it's Jim Feeney or or some other person, but I think it would be appropriate. So, and any other questions for Christine and John on the uh, facilities budget? Annie or Tara, can you see any questions? Oh, okay. Nope. All right. So, Christine or John, do you want to make a motion? I move that we approve the facilities um, department budget in the amount of $868,434. Okay. So, um, is there a second? Second. Yeah, seconded by Annie LaCourt. Um, so the the uh, budget facilities budget for $868,434 has been moved and seconded. Is there any further question or comments by anybody on the committee? All right, so seeing none, we'll take a vote on the facilities budget. Grant Gibeon is not here. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Kaya Healy. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Arif Padaria. Yes. Sophie Migliazzo. Yes. Jonathan, Jonathan's not here. I'm here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. He's not here. Um, Al Tassi. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's unanimous uh, vote in favor of the facilities budget as presented for $868,434. Charlie, mm -hmm. uh, before, yes. we, before we leave the facilities department, budget. Um, I do have uh, an, a, an answer to a question regarding the warrant article on um, the net zero warrant article. Um, okay. um, uh, do you want me to uh, let you tell you what Jim Feeney's view of it is? Can we, um, can we, uh, Tara, are you there? Who's, who's, who's got the, who's driving the screen? Uh, me. Can you flip up the warrant article? Um, Yes. Please. One sec. Sorry, can you see this? Uh, I it's that's a little better that way. I think yeah. Do you remember what article that was? Um, I have the new numbering. Okay. So one sec here. Zero. True net zero opt-in for a code for cities and towns. Is that right? I think yes. Is it the resolution or is there something, was it a resolution or was it something else? Cause there's, there's no, another. It was a bylaw proposal. Okay. One sec. Um, achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Here we go. This one? Right, yeah, that's yes. the one. The, the, um, the short answer is uh, that Jim Feeney doesn't know what impact that will have because uh, nobody has seen the, the details, the actual language of the Warren article. Um, he, he told us that uh, generally speaking, the facility department the town as a whole is committed to um, energies, energy efficiencies and eliminating um, 
um, greenhouse gases. However, um, as he put it, decarbonization means the town will have to um, um, uh, rely on greater electrification, which means a lot of the, uh, which will, will require a lot of investment in our buildings, um, which is going to take uh, money and we don't know if we will have that money and also might throw uh, um, a, uh, a monkey wrench into our current capital plan because we've already uh, uh, have uh, put in certain uh, uh, projects that ha are, which may be just um, um, unable, we would not be un unable to do if uh, we would require electrification of, of buildings or, or whatnot. So, so the, in summary, although the, the, the concepts is something that the town supports, it may become a, a, an expensive um, and difficult endeavor for the town, but everyone is, at least Jim Feeney seems to be reserving final judgment when there's actual language to look at in the bylaw. Thank you, Christine. So, so Tara, uh, we certainly have to have a hearing on that article. Okay, let me um, make sure we have that. So we okay. have, yes, okay, hearing needed. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Christine. And you have your hand up. Well, I was just going to ask, but I could save it for the hearing. Um, I, I know the high school is an all electric building. Is the DPW project also an all electric project? I mean, I know our new buildings are all going to be all electric. I can't answer. I don't know. Uh, can't recall. Yeah, it, we'll find out. Head, but, I wouldn't. But I think, I think it would be, they, they have a goal of being LEEDS compliant. Yeah. So that would be all electric. Well, uh, again, I don't know exactly. Yeah. As I mentioned, the infrastructure is being taken out and replaced. Right. So. Yeah, I don't think uh, we, that's 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 a question we could also bring up to the capital planning committee. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Christine. So. Um, are there any other budgets this evening? Um, uh, so if we had time, uh, Al has a couple of articles, I believe, for us to look yeah, at. We have, we actually have um, the IT budget. Um, yeah, the IT budget and other financial follow-up question uh, issues. Al, Al Tassi. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we did the IT budget already. No, you had some follow-up, follow-up. Um... Yes, remember I emailed them to you. you. Could you bring them up to the committee in case they haven't seen the email? I thought you would forward it. Tara, did you forward I my email? Forward it, uh, let, me, let me grab it. Can you also see my, well, maybe, hold on a second. Um, yes. Okay. So it was, um, under moving costs and it was just sent today at 507. Um, so we have a little bit of information here. Can everyone see this kind of? I, I'm, it, it, it's a little small for me to be honest. Better? That's a little better, yeah. Okay. And then we also so, have some costs below this. So the, the answer to one question was that the water and sewer billing is the last program to move. And um, and IT is now over on uh, 23 Maple Street in the town hall. Okay. And the, and the cost is down below? 
Yes, so there is some more information about, let's see. It's gonna be going to the high school project, right? Yes, and it looks like some people were moved out of the high school. IT was formerly in the high school. So I guess the whole move, move is getting covered by the high school project. Is that basically it now? Yes. Looks like the yeah, giving getting ready to be moved over DPW when it's ready. And yeah, okay. And then I think there's a little bit more below that. Yeah. Okay. So in any event, that's not going to be that means it's not going to come out as an operating budget item in facilities or IT or any other places because it's covered by the the building program. Good. Thank you. Cool. Um, so Tara, do we have, um, do you have your, your, your marked up? Um... So I have, um, I have put the notes that we had in this document here with the new numbering system. So most of them stayed, a lot of them stayed the same. Um, and then the ones that had a new number are highlighted in the yellow with the new number and then the temporary number. Um, and I counted and we have um, all the same, the same amount of articles. So no, no new articles, nothing. And I, I didn't see any names changing in here. Um, so I have here what needs a hearing or recommendation and like any kind of notes that we took on it. Um, and we can go back to that original document as well, um, but it's all, I believe, captured here. Great. So let's, um, let's just scan down this except list. For, except for this, except for I seem to mess up. Okay, I'll come back to this, but. Yeah, well, that, that we don't need hearings on. Okay, anyway, yeah. So, so yeah. Daryl, you're, you're going to follow up on the Police Advisory Commission, right? Uh, yes, I have a question then to Chief Priority um, that I sent last night, and uh, I'll send a, <clears throat> the similar question to the, the co-chairs of the um, the Citizen Advisory, whatever it's called. Okay. The Civilian Police Advisory Commission. Okay. Would you like me to sort here by what? I, I no, can... we'll, let's just go. We'll just go down down the list. Okay. I think that's fine. Okay, the uh, net zero we just discussed, um, and we have to have a hearing, so that's fine. Um, yeah, and Al Tassi suggested a meeting on the um, uh, on domestic partnerships, and then um, okay, going down to the noise abatement and noise regulations, leaf blowers. Christine, do you have any further thoughts on that? Charlie, we're scheduled to meet with the, the DPW director tomorrow and okay. we'll get an answer then. then. Okay, so, so, so Monday we can, um, we will know whether we should have a hearing or, or not. Right. Know, okay. Um, Okay, so this this uh, next article will be taken up. Wanda, Andy, Andy, when are we going to take that up? Do we need to have a special hearing? Well, we have um, Director Bongiorno coming to our meeting on March 14th. Okay. So unless that's too late, I think we could ask her that question at that point as to whether or not it has financial implications. Um, and then I guess we would have to decide whether or not we needed to hold a hearing with the proponents if Christine thinks it's gonna cost money. I could send her an email in advance and- Perhaps That would be a good everything. idea because the 14th is sort of late. If, All right. if you just take, take, do that. take her pulse on that and then um, we can decide about a hearing. You want me to go back to the original language of this one? 
No, no, no. I'm just scanning down the list. Okay, so the next one is the street trees, is um, one we didn't have a resolution on. Sophie, uh, have you any feedback on that? I have um, sent an email out, and I'm waiting for a response. I'm sorry. Who, who, who did you send it to? To Jenny. I'm planning a planning and community development. Okay, so we should know maybe by Monday what yeah certainly okay. okay keep scanning on down um we're getting to the peg budget okay these are all items these are financial items that we're going to dis discuss directly um the um Appropriation for blue bikes, that's unknown. Okay, so Jonathan's gonna figure out what we're gonna do there, all right. Um, oh, and, and really quick, um, I've heard back from everyone now. Only one person, only one um, committee is uh, requesting an increase. Um, 11 of them are not, and one is still um, probably not going to, but just researching it. Um, okay. But I just wanted to, to point out on this one that it seems like there's a new one added called the design standards. And so would we want a hearing on this because it was not included last year. It's a new yes. like, commission. Okay, so we want one. Yeah. You're asking for $50,000? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that it needs a hearing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, where were we? Harry Barber, um, Tara, you're going to follow up on that. Yeah. I think if it's the same amount, we don't need a hearing. And um, Al Tassi. Yes. Is, it, is this uh, is this Warren article the? Uh, no, this is the disability article, right? Yeah. What isn't there? Wasn't there always a Warren article uh, to adjust the retirees' cost of living expense? No, the, the cost of living uh, is decided by the retirement board. This is an article to allow people whose pensions fall below fifty percent of the current salary for that position to be brought back up to the 50%. And I'm ready to make a recommendation on that and OPEB if uh, if you would like. Um, so that's, that's this is the Warren article and you're also referring to the OPEB Warren article, right? Right. Okay, I, that's fine. Let's do it since we're here. Okay, one second. Tara, could you bring up the uh, article and motions? Yes. Um, let's see, it's over here. So let me see if I can, yeah, here we go, here we go. Um, nope, sorry. Um, is this the one? Nope, sorry, one sec. Maybe I put it in here. No, I have it up somewhere in my slew of tabs. So just a second here. Uh, one sec. You're, you're looking for the text on the Warren article or I'm looking and the motions. I drafted the motion. Okay. What the hell do I do with it? Oh, well, I know one place it is, so so we'll just look for it in here.
Nope. We're gonna need like just two minutes to look for this. Where, where uh, Al, where did you, uh, did you send it as an email today? I, I sent it to Tara probably about five o'clock. Um, Here we go. Oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, I got it. And it's not loading, nice. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. Good work. Okay, uh, the first one is article, uh, this is article 67 in the new uh, draft of the warrant. Uh, just to bring everybody up to date, uh, including the new people, probably about 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, the Finance Committee and the Retirement Board came to an agreement on how to fund the uh, OPEB, which is the other post-employment uh, benefit trust fund. And at that time, uh, we had the non-contributory, uh, which we talked about earlier in the retirement system, was about, was $500,000. Now that non-contributory we knew was gonna be declining over a period of time. So we agreed that the difference between 500,000 and the actual contribution to the non-contributory retirement, that difference would be taken and put into the OPEB fund. And so, you know, the first few years, it might have been an appropriation of 450,000. So we take 50,000. And then maybe it was the two years, it was 350,000. So we put 150,000 in OPEB. So this A represents that agreement. Now, I could probably rework this language, but I could do it. So this is, since the base of 500,000, since the appropriation for the non-contributory is zero, um, then we'll put the whole 500,000 uh, into the OPEB fund. Uh, B is an appropriation of 155,000. Uh, years ago, uh, the Board of Selectmen in 2006 voted to reduce the town's share of retiree um, indemnity plans from 90% to 85%, which means the, the retirees would go from 10% to 15%. That saved the town $155,000 approximately. And the Selectmen said they would do that only if that whole 155 goes into the OPEB fund. So every year since then, we've been appropriating 155 into the OPEB fund. C is uh, back in 2014, I think it was, maybe 2013, uh, the town entered, uh, put all its employees under the GIC, the Group Insurance Commission of the state. Uh, because uh, before that we were self-insured, uh, which means we didn't have insurance. And so we had a large trust fund of three, approximately $3 million. And uh, since we went into the GIC, uh, we didn't need a trust fund because that was an insurance plan. And so rather than just have $3 million sitting around doing nothing, we agreed over a period of time to transfer 300,000 each year from the trust fund into the OPEB fund. Uh, so these are the three amounts then. So right now we're up to $955,000 uh, 
uh, going into the OPEB fund. Uh, and I think when we went through the retirement, <coughs> I think we're funding about 10% of the liability now. Liability is about 225. Uh, we have about 25 million in the OPEB fund. Uh, so this, along with the investment earnings of the current OPEB fund, you know, we'll keep increasing that. Uh, so if there's any if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions for Al? So Al, uh, do you know what the amount of um, money left in the, in the health insurance trust fund is? Uh, I asked that. There's still a million and a half to two million dollars, or something like that. So there's still a substantial amount left in the trust fund. Okay. Um, why wouldn't we just uh, transfer it all into um, into the um, OPEB? I think the the manager made the point at the time that if we go back into a self-insured plan, then uh, we don't want to drain it all of it too fast uh, in case we want to uh, set up a self-insurance plan and get out of the GIC. So the plan was to do 300 a year. <clears throat> the, uh, what, what, yeah, the other concern at the time was that um, there might be some residual claims uh, from um, you know people who were under treatment or whatever prior to um, us joining the GIC that still had to be covered from the trust fund. But I think that time has passed. I don't think there are any more cases like that. Would, I wouldn't think so. So, okay. Um, and then just for, um, for the, well, the reason I ask, maybe you can just explain uh, to the committee the uh, two different uh, unfunded liability views on OPEB um, because if we if we contribute more to the OPEB then the unfunded liability goes down. Right now if you do uh, contributions to OPEB uh, based on an actuarial study then you could use uh, a lower interest rate to, to evaluate that actuarial liability. Um, but to do an actuarial liability funded plan, I think it was something like 10 to $12 million a year would have to go into the OPEB fund, which we obviously don't have. Um, so this is not an actuarial uh, funding plan. This is a funding plan made up of different sources uh, that we happen to have. Now, at some point we might want to, uh, you know, different towns have taken different looks at this. I think the town of Wellesley actually had a override to fully fund their OPEB liability. Um, and, uh, you know, other, um, I think it was Natick, um, they, they got the Natick Mall and there was so much money coming in that they used a portion of that to go into the OPEB fund. So, you know, different, different towns approach it differently. We approached it, let's get some money flowing in there. <clears throat> and it's almost, you know, 2 million a year now, or sorry, a million a year, close to it, uh, going into the fund. And, uh, you know, we haven't taken anything away from any other budgets. Thank you, Al. So, uh, Al, do you wanna make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion uh, to fund the OPEB under the article that you see, articles and sections that you see now uh, for a total of uh, $955,000. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any other questions for Al uh, on this uh, article um, 67? Yes, Wanda. I just had a question. Can you hear me? Yes. About the, you mentioned it was 10% funded. And I wondered if, if there was a goal or a plan or is 10% the goal or it's just what we've been able to accumulate over the years? Well, right now it's, it's been what we've been able to accumulate over the years. And we've been lucky that, you know, the, the, the economy has done very well uh, over the last number of years. So that, that's grown. So we've got about 22 million in the OPEB fund now. I think the next big factor would be 
when the retirement system is fully funded. And if you remember from last week, uh, that's gonna be fully funded in 2033, which is only 11 years from now. Uh, I don't know if any of us will still be on the committee at that point, but, uh, and then all of a sudden the retirement, uh, large retirement appropriation goes away. I can't remember the exact amount, but it's quite amount of money. Uh, and we could shift that money into the OPEP and, and much more rapidly fund that system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Al. Um, Annie? Do we yet have a legal requirement to fund OPEP? No. I can, I can answer that. The answer is no. Okay. The issue is that um, we're not required to, we are not for, legally required to pay for the ins health insurance of the retirees. That's been a practice and um, it is, the council has advised us that it is, um, it's not in the, I don't believe that in the labor contracts that it's a condition of employment, but it's been in place for so long that it is a de facto condition of employment. And probably uh, if, we, if it was litigated, we might not be successful. So therefore, uh, and then there's always the possibility that the legislature will mandate it, in which case um, it makes sense for both of those reasons to, to be, and, and, we, and we are covering the health insurance of employees. So to not cover it, we would have to stop a practice. And it just doesn't make sense to, to not be funding the fund. But we're not talking about their employment, their health insurance while they're employed. We're talking about post-employment. Post-employment, yes. And all of our employees are now in Medicare. I mean, historically, we probably have some we're carrying that we're not, but currently they all are, correct? I, I believe that's accounted for in the actuarial right. study. Um, how, many, how many employees are on uh, uh, Medicare? Um, you go on Medicare if you're eligible for Medicare, but if you didn't pay into Medicare, and your spouse is not eligible for Medicare, then you're not eligible for Medicare. Medicare. No, so but we've put, we've put our employees in the Medicare system. All of our current employees are paying into Medicare. Right, but a lot of the employees who, uh, before we did that, uh, did not pay into Medicare. Yeah, I, I understand that. I just wanna get the big picture out here. So we don't have a legal obligation, so we don't have a funding schedule that we gotta meet. And, but we think we're, we're legally obligated by past practice to fund their health insurance. But we have put employees at, at some point, I think sometime in the eighties, we started putting all our employees into Medicare. So eventually we are down to our liability being the Medigap insurance. It's also that liability is on our balance sheets that go out to bond buyers and the credit rating yep. agencies. Wanda, you have a question. No, I think I forgot to take my hand down. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Does anyone have any uh, additional comments on this um, article? 67 in the current draft of the warrant that we have. Charlie? Yes. David. Uh, yes, uh, I'll be abstaining on this um, this article for reasons okay. that I am a member of the uh, retire. I received okay. retirement from the town of Allington as well okay. as health insurance. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's move to a vote on article. Um, I'll use the number sixty-seven uh, as presented for by Al for nine hundred fifty-five thousand uh, dollars. Grant Gibeon not uh, here. Shane Blundell, yes. John Ellis, yes. Micaiah Healy, yes. Brian Beck, yes. Arif Adaria, yes. Uh, Sophie Mangliazzo, yes. Um, uh, Shailene uh, Crawford Prokuris, not here. Uh, Daryl Harmer. 
Yes. Uh, Andy LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Oh, he's not here. Um, Alan Tosti. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yeah. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. I will abstain. Abstain. Okay. So we have to have. Fifteen in favor and one abstention. And the uh, vote is uh, passed. Article sixty-seven. Okay, Al, you have another uh, article. Yes. Okay, this is actually an uh, article sixty-four in the new uh, the new draft. Uh, as I think I mentioned before. When a town employee retires, um, they're getting a cost of living raise only on their first $15,000 of pension. So let's say their pension is $30,000 a year. Uh, they're getting a cost of living raise on their first fifteen. dollars Meanwhile, the employee who now replaced them in that position is getting a cost of living raise on their whole 30,000. So gradually that employee will be getting a lesser and lesser percentage. Let's say they started at 75%. They're gradually over a period of like 20 or 30 years, they're gonna, their percentage of their old job is gonna be going down. If what this article does, and we've been told that we have to do, we have to pass it every year, is allow the retirement board uh, to uh, bring, if the employee falls below 50% of their salary, uh, of the salary that's getting now, this allows the retirement board to move them up, back up to the 50%. So it basically sets a floor. Uh, and people don't reach that floor uh, usually for quite a while. And I think the uh, retirement board has usually said the cost is someplace around uh, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, if I remember from from past years. Now uh, you'll see a date in the middle, uh, provided, however, that no one retires after May one, two thousand ten. Uh, this is to close a little loophole uh, that was found uh, by people who did this not to have this as a floor, but to boost it up to 50%. Um, so that's why that phrase is there with a specific date uh, to close that loophole. So this has to be passed each year by town meeting. Uh, that's what it does is basically allows the retirement board uh, to keep everybody at least at that 50% floor. Questions for uh, for Al? Yes, Shane. Thanks, Al. Um, can you just like do a real world example for me? I know it's late, but can you just sort of just a, sort of a just a quick poor example of how this works in practice? So comparing like a retired police officer to like uh, a current officer on a patrol man. Well, a woman. Me, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uniformed officers go under a bit of a different system but let's okay. just take a public works guy uh he retires he was making uh fifty thousand dollars um he retired at full uh and he gets eighty percent so he got forty thousand dollars um and then gradually over a period of time the fifty thousand dollar salary um is is going up at the whole fifty thousand is going up at 3%, let's say it's a 3% cost of living. Meanwhile, his 40,000, only 15,000 is got a cost of living. So therefore his percentage of that job is going down each year. And if at some point it fell below the 50% of the current job, 
because of uh, he's only getting the cost of living on a, a third of his pension, then this allows him to at least keep it at 50%. Thank you. Other questions for Al on uh, this article? Okay, um, so uh, is there a dollar figure here, Al? No, we, we used to put in a buck and the, it was driving the uh, controller crazy because this dollar sat there year after year. So we finally decided to just make it zero. Uh, and, and then if for some reason the retirement system needed some extra dollars to fund this, uh, then we could transfer it into this article. Um, and the retirement system has never needed money. So we've just set it at zero. <clears throat> okay. So I'd like to make a motion of favorable action on article 67. Ignore the number that's up there. Second. So it's been moved and seconded sorry, for action on article 67. 64. No, I'm sorry, it's 64. Yeah, 64, okay. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded. Any further questions or discussion? Uh, Charlie, I'll be voting, uh, abstaining again on this article. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments, questions? All right, let's go to article 64 for a vote. Grant Gibbons is not here. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Uh, Makaya Healy? Yes. Um, Brian Beck? Yes. Harry Padaria? Yes. Steve? Yes. Toby? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Wallach's not here. Here. Um, Shailene's not here. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller's not here. Uh, Al Tosti? Yes. Juan Nascimento? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Uh, Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna. Abstain. So it's 15 in favor, one abstention. The article is voted as presented by Al Tosti. Okay. Uh, any other articles that anyone might have? So. Um, um, I. Al, did you have this uh, this last one here? Yeah, we're we're not prepared to take action on that. We need to discuss it. Okay. Thank you. So, um, we've done a, a a second pass on the uh, on the warrant articles. So, um, Tara, you're going to post that Excel spreadsheet that you had um, on the SharePoint site, right? Yes. So everyone can feel free to take a look at that. And, and if you have any concerns about any of the articles that you think we should have a hearing that we haven't yet so designated, uh, please feel free to bring it up at the, uh, at the next meeting. So I don't think we have any more work this, to do this evening, unless- um, uh, Jolly? Yeah. Uh, um, David? Yes, um, on the last Monday, you asked, uh, Sophie and I did to uh, look at the amendments to FY22 budget. Uh, artic it was article. Oh, yes. 60 yes, you're right. That's right. That, and I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Um, go right ahead. Okay. Um, Tuesday morning, I had a, a conversation with the, Sandy Pula, and he sent an email to you, Charlie, and I'll, I'll just highlight the email as to. Uh, pertaining to this article. Um, it's per, it actually, um, Dean kind of alluded to this explanation uh, last Monday as well. Its purpose is to transfer funds set aside in case of 
school growth um, School growth reserve fund to the reserve fund to the overlay reserve fund. This allows us to increase the over, overlay reserve fund by the full amount of one million ninety four zero fifty five, instead of having it refer it to free cash at the end of the year. This seems to be the easiest way to, to make this transfer, and that was uh, Sandy's response to our inquiry and he sent the, uh, that response also to our chairman Charlie. Yes, Th thank you, David. Um, I forgot about that. And um, so following that email, I, I had a conversation with uh, Sandy about it. And the first thing is that he, he misspoke or he mistyped. And he's talking about the override stabilization fund, not the overlay reserve fund. So um, it's actually the override stabilization fund. And the issue, the issue is that um, if we don't do something with that money this fiscal year, it's going to go to free cash, and um, it, it can't be looked upon as revenue going into uh, the next fiscal year for for another year. So um, there are cur currently, and, and furthermore, uh, I don't think this article here uh, solves the problem. Because if it's in the main, if it's in the main town meeting, um, the annual town meeting, the annual town meeting is not going to get approved by the Department of Revenue and the Attorney General until sometime in July or August. And so that money will be in the reserve fund at the end of the year and it will automatically go to free cash. And this article won't have any impact. So there are two. Uh, possibilities for how we can get that money in there that I discussed with Sandy today. And is is he's of the opinion, and I don't, I don't know that it's possible, but uh, he's of the opinion that it doesn't that the um, well, I'm of the opinion that the finance committee can transfer that money um, into the override stabilization fund by a simple vote at any time. Okay, um, and he's going to check with uh, town council on that. Secondly, um, it may if we can't if we can't do that, then uh, we'll put this article in the special town meeting that's being contemplated. And then when the special town meeting, which usually lasts one night in in May, gets to the, the Attorney General's office, it gets approved much quicker, and and then the um, much more quickly, I should say, and the um, the the amount of money that one million and ninety five thousand dollars, as I recall, will be able to go directly into the stabilization fund, the override stabilization fund, before the end of the year, and and then it can be taken out by our normal action on the override stabilization fund in the annual town meeting. So that's the, um, that's the genesis of that article and the conversation with, um, that David had with um, Sandy Pooler. Any questions? So we don't have to have a hearing on that. Um, we, if, if the article shows up in the special town meeting warrant, we'll have to make a recommendation. Shane. Thanks. I I I, I want to. I'm not sure I understand this, but this is the the enrollment. This is the money we agreed to send into the yes the, the school we're enrollment using, to the. We're, we're not using the money, okay? Yes. So if it's in the reserve fund at the end of the year, it goes into free cash, and we can't use it for another year. Okay. Yeah, I guess that, that was my next. Why? Can't, like, what's the difference? What's the policy reason of having because the free free cash doesn't get certified until maybe September, and and um, so you can't you can't do anything with free cash for an entire year because of our cycle of uh, operations. Okay. So and your so your proposal. Go ahead. Do you have your hand? Pardon me, Jane. And sorry, thank you. Uh, just one closing comment or question or other. So the 
So you're you're worried about timing. Um, so you're exploring whether the finance committee can use its sort of limited authority. Well, in, to... in principle, we can vote money out of the reserve fund at any time. However, um, there is, I, I, I can't remember from last year, but I think there's special language. You know, we said that this is going to be used for schools. So if it's not used for schools, can we actually take a vote and put it into the override stabilization fund? So town council has to make that decision and, you know, advise us on that. No, I mean, nobody can say that we're um, doing anything irregular with the town's money. We're just saving it, okay? And if that's the case, we should do it before the, you know, before the end of town meeting. Um, if, if we can't do that, then an article like this in the special town meeting will get that transfer accomplished prior to the end of our annual town meeting. So the money will be available to use in next year's budget. Thank you. You're welcome. Al Tassi. Why, I agree, the simplest way would be to just transfer the money, but we have an Warren article in the annual town meeting uh, to transfer, uh, to appropriate funds in or out or transfer funds in or out of the override stabilization fund. Why can't we just word the motion in the regular town meeting so town meeting transfers the money out of the reserve fund into the override stabilization fund and it's there because the town meeting isn't um accredited or or approved until august and at at the end of june that money is still in the reserve fund and that entire reserve fund goes into free cash. I, I mean, if town meeting makes the transfer, town meeting is dissolved in May uh, and it's, and it's uh, effective in mid June and the controller would transfer the money, I would think. Uh, okay, but let, let's let the town council decide that, you know, I mean, I think I think the uh, um, the simplest thing would be for the finance committee just to do the transfer tomorrow morning. Um, but if it can't, then the safe way to do it is to do it in the special town meeting. Yeah. Okay, whichever. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, David, for bringing that up. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would say um, a motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Seconded? Second. Moved and seconded. I see everybody's hands up. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Take care. Bye.